Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a member today by clicking the join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks including two weekly members only videos with limited ads, monthly members only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. And as always, thank you all for your support. The following stories are from Bobby Short's book, The De Facto Sasquatch. Fred Bradshaw. I've written a lot about Fred Bradshaw. He was one of the really colorful characters involved in research in the early days. He lived one mile south of Elma, Grays Harbor County, Washington, just off Highway 12 South, in the heart of Bigfoot country. Once he discovered the internet, he unloaded a life's worth of encounters with the Sasquatch and led many a novice to their first sighting. His stories of his brushes with the Sasquatch people both amazed and baffled those of us who listened to him. Fred was very active in the field in Washington. He easily located all manner of Sasquatch tracks in and around where he lived that ranged from 14 inches in length by 6 inches at the ball of the foot and 4 inches at the heel. The stride was measured at 43 inches. There were additional tracks in the range of 17 inches in length that had a stride length of 52 inches and more. Bradshaw told stories of the Sasquatch rocking his small trailer side to side and hearing them vocalize at night. The rocking back and forth of trailers, all manner of vehicles and truck toppers is often a reported behavior. Bradshaw never lost the enthusiasm for locating the big folks and seemed genuinely interested in relating their behaviors to anyone within earshot. I remember an email from his sister, and I believe she said he died of a massive heart attack out in the field while hunting. It was what he loved to do. Gesturing, arguing. Outdoorsman hunter Peter Ray Williams reported that he was traveling northbound on Colorado 96 past Wetmore en route to Florence when he blew a right rear tire. He pulled over to change the tire just a few yards short of the right turn to CR 389. It was about 7.50 p.m. in the evening. William stated that he was putting on the spare and dumping the blowed tire in the bed of the truck when something caught his attention up the road to his right. I looked up and was shocked to see two Bigfoot-looking creatures crossing the road from east to west in about three to four steps and disappear in an open field in setting sun on the other side. He swears he heard them talking in a frantic kind of nattering I looked up because I thought what I was hearing was men arguing. Just that quick, they were there walking across the road. I heard these sounds, maybe talking angrily, and then they were gone. Williams figures they were either fleeing the fire line off to north-northeast or were confused or displaced. He described them as black, one taller than the other, and the bigger one wasn't looking where it was going, but looking at the other Bigfoot with arms straight down at his sides, and the other one was gesturing, not wildly, just gesturing with its hands about something. Maybe, he speculated, they were arguing, but they carried on like people do on their merry way. It was really wild seeing my first Bigfoot sighting. I don't know if they were male or female. As fast as my eyes adjusted to seeing them, they were gone. Man, they moved, but they weren't running. We saw a couple of deer cross Road 96 earlier. There was a wildfire burning off in the distance, somewhere towards the east. William's stepdaughter, Leslie Ann Marshall, was also witness to the event, but she was inside the cab of the truck caring for a baby. In a telephone interview, Mrs. Marshall said she thought they were both better than eight feet in height and thought they must both be males. She didn't hear any sounds from them. She wasn't outside the truck, but she did hear Pete yelling at her to look at the big feet crossing the road. I already saw them by the time Dad started yelling at me, she said. I saw them coming, but thought I was seeing things. Yeah, this is like not a real happening. Who would believe this? They were both big males, I believe like two big dudes. Firefighters report Sioux Lookout tracks after fire. It was mid-July 1996, and it was a hot day. It had rained for a few days earlier, so that the forest fire was cool enough to respond to act against. The fire number was Sioux Lookout Fire number 70. In the forest about one mile north of the kilometer 74 signs on the Vermilion River Road north of Sioux Lookout, Ontario, Canada, 
Sioux Lookout is a town about 400 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay, Ontario, and it is visible on most world maps. The sighting was on the north side of a large lake called Lac Sol. The logging road turns off the highway 27 miles northwest of Sioux Lookout, and then the road goes straight north. There are signs every kilometer showing the distance. Kilometer 74 is about two kilometers before the Root River, which should also show up on a detailed map of the area. Several of my co-workers and I were patrolling for smudges and looking for smoke and other burning material that needed to be extinguished when we came across huge footprints in the middle of nowhere. We were all firefighters, which was our summer job. They came across one footprint in some mud that was huge. They took a few pictures of it and even had a tape measure to determine its length. Aaron McGill, November 26, 1996. There wasn't much in the way of detail in the Aaron McGill footprint find, and nothing as it relates to Sasquatch behavior, other than tracks were found in the aftermath of what must have been a devastating forest fire. But in 1996, when McGill sent in the notice, research was hungry for any case that mentioned Bigfoot and forest fires, and so I mention it here for the many questions that come in each fire season. There's a more interesting story that begins with an interest in another forestry fire lookout tower, this time in the Estacada region of Clackamas County, Oregon. The lengthy story was beautifully written by Vanessa Voorhees and published in the Estacada News October 1, 2008, so it is a fairly recent report. In her words, While hiking along the snowy banks of the Clackamas River late one January afternoon in 1969, Millie Kiggins of Estacada her husband and her friend, Art Schneider, found something that would thrust the Kingans and the quiet wilderness surrounding Estacada into an international spotlight. We went to look at a Forest Service cabin up Squaw Lake on the way to Cold Springs about 20 miles from Estacada, Kiggins said. They were going to sell them and we wanted to look at them. We started out late and we were in about three feet of snow. There was a gate and we couldn't get through, so we started to walk and it looked like someone had already gotten through because there were tracks in the snow. They noticed the large size of the tracks and their depth, and they were 18 inches deep, she said. Whatever had made them was heavy, because ours were a couple of inches deep. It had to have been walking on two feet, and its stride was 67 inches. The path of the tracks was in a straight line, too straight to be man-made footprints, she said. The hikers followed the imprints for about a quarter mile before they realized it was getting late, and decided to turn back. Before leaving, Kiggins documented their discovery with a photograph and contacted the U.S. Forest Service. They said it was a snowshoe rabbit. I have no idea what it was, but if it was a rabbit, it would have to be a big one to make footprints that large. I told them if it was a snowshoe rabbit, they had better look out, because it's big enough to eat them, she said. Back at home on their farm on the outskirts of Estacada, the Kiggins began to experience a series of Bigfoot-like phenomena. He was around here for a year, she said. We found footprints all over the farm. Once, they led to a five-foot fence and continued on the other side, uninterrupted, as if he stepped right over it. Sometimes we would smell him. Smelled like a bad nursing home. We heard loud screams and grunts all at once, lasting 10 or 15 seconds. It could be heard miles away. The hair on the back of your neck would stand up. It spooked the cattle. A U.S. Forest Service employee, not wishing to be identified, said she had never taken a single Bigfoot report in the 12 years she had worked at the desk of the Clackamas River Ranger District office in Estacada. We don't have a book or a piece of paper that states sightings at all, she said. She refused comment further for fear she would get into trouble again. True, perhaps, but a strange remark by the forestry official. Deny, deny. Sasquatch and RVs. This next report is secondhand and relates a situation where a vehicle was violently rocked back and forth. This time it wasn't a travel trailer. The behavior is interesting and quite familiar to those of us who follow these submissions to the data. In each case, the mischievous Sasquatch was easily run off by the men in the RV with no apparent drama in the aftermath. Are they looking for attention or trying to scare off the campers? Some feel they're just having a bit of ill-behaved fun. I've heard them called tricksters, but I don't think I'd find it too amusing if I was parked in an RV alone at night. A few years ago, I was visiting friends in Campbell River on Vancouver Island. 
A friend of mine, Ted Story, used to live there. He took me fishing on a lake in the mountains. He told me about a fishing trip in that area and what happened to him. It seemed they returned to their RV after fishing and had a few beers. It was dark when someone or something tried to push their RV over. One of the men hurried outside of the RV and saw a large thing, like a person, run off, leaving a bad smell. They did not want to report it because the authorities would say it was their imagination. I heard later footprints were cast. Oliver Parker, March 2012 Sasquatch and Trucks Along those lines, Patrick T. wrote in late August 2011 that he had a strange incident while fishing the Pecos River near Loving, Eddy County, New Mexico. One night while sleeping in my pickup truck, I was awakened by the truck being shaken, rocked back and forth. I had to work up the nerve to rise up and look out, but I didn't see anything. Later in the course of another fishing trip to the Pecos River, I heard a loud splash in the river where I was fishing, something thrown into the Pecos, and then all went quiet. I keep a revolver close now. It would seem the stories, complete with the same Sasquatch behavior, are told over and over throughout Sasquatch history. Rock throwing, vehicle and camper rocking are consistently reported manner of conduct by an errant Sasquatch. Aerospace engineer Dr. Kim Carl of Santa Monica, California, reminded me in the summer of 2011 of a story Fred Bradshaw told him about seeing a Sasquatch cross the road in front of his truck. It looked into the truck's front window, and according to Bradshaw, it had a smile on its face. It may have been misinterpreted by Bradshaw. It could have simply been a show of teeth, aggression. These are little-known details about Sasquatch life that would be interesting if we had more information about their culture and their rules of living. Dr. Carl wrote, he, Bradshaw, was one of the most friendly, generous men I met along the way. Bradshaw had genuine love for his friends, a peach of a guy in my book. On June 16, 2001, Bradshaw sent me a message. It read, about 8.30 p.m., while out with George Carras's group in one of my research areas near Fort Lewis Army Base, Pierce County, Washington, I saw a white Sasquatch and brought it to the attention of the others in the group. What I saw was from mid-chest up to the head, and you're right, they stand out like a lighthouse. This animal was so white, it didn't look real. Black face, about seven feet tall from what I could see. It was a mind-blowing day. On Saturday, June 30th that same year, Fred wrote that he was smiled at again. It was a wide smile, showing teeth, this time near the backside of the Fort Lewis Army Base in civilian territory. But the creature was not white. This time Bradshaw was smiled at by a big, dark-colored Sasquatch, so dark that the only details visible happened to be his white teeth. Many of Bradshaw's stories, including vocalizations, were directed at him, it was almost like they recognized him and didn't care who he brought along with him. Crazy and unusual behavior. Stone throwing. The Greenwell Report from the Six Rivers Project noted three incidents of throwing various objects, logs on two occasions and rocks on another. Noting that bears and other wildlife do not throw things, the late ISC Secretariat Richard Greenwell said in his time that he interpreted the behavior a mark of primate intimidation. Throwing objects is not new, but an old reliable behavior that has happened to many a field person. Intent by the Sasquatch can only be speculated on, but it's obvious the intent was not to harm. If harm was the objective, they certainly have the power to inflict any manner of injury and destruction. It is said they hunt effectively with stones to bring down prey. I imagine the Sasquatch and other primitive men were proficient at stone throwing. Playing from a hidden spot. One such incident involved the family of Wes and Natalie Pee Wee Summerlin when they camped out for several days at a favorite spot called Timothy Meadows, also in the state of Washington. It was while enjoying such an outing that the youngsters of the family were playing in the open field with a soccer ball. The soccer ball suddenly careened off the designated field area and into the brush at the edge of the clearing. Straight away, the ball became airborne out of the darkness of the timber-lined field and back onto the playing field. This happened once more, according to former game warden Mr. Bill Laffery. Recalling the incident, Laffery said there were no humans in the bush at the time. 
adult or juveniles, the behavior was a playful one, and the Summerlin family enjoyed the hairy man's participation. Belly crawling. Stories that mention being watched from hidden spots often involve the Bigfoot watching children play. There was a report, and perhaps it was by David Hawley, at the time associated with the Texoma, Texas Bigfoot research team, who wrote that he had observed the Sasquatch crawling towards him on its stomach, belly crawling. Hawley found it rather unsettling to have a creature that size crawling towards him in high grass. It was huge, and he only saw it momentarily as he turned to a fellow researcher to answer his question. The remark was posted publicly January 13, 2002, on the old Red and Black Network 54.com forum. Evidently, Hawley observed a Sasquatch belly crawling once before, and also using embankments to squat behind while observing him. There were reports on that same forum by individuals who witnessed the Sasquatch hunkering down, then crawling around on hands and knees in an effort to observe human interactions without being discovered. Carol B. watched a reddish-black Bigfoot crawl toward her home from a second-story bedroom window in the fall of 2011. It occurred in broad daylight and was described as crawling like a horned toad lizard. Its hair was matted and dirty. Its focus was on two pet goats romping in the yard with her children. When the witness's husband went out into the yard, the Bigfoot fled. Crawling is a behavior not often reported. Screamer watches children at play. Dana Richardson, a resident of Fairfield Center, Maine, shared this 2005 sighting. My family gathered to celebrate a birthday. Eight of my nieces and nephews, aged from six to nine, were in the backyard playing. When suddenly, all of the children started screaming, and they all came running into the porch area. I could tell by the screaming that something terrified them. I ran out onto the porch to see what was going on. My oldest nephew, age of nine, told me that a big black man was watching them from the edge of the woods. I could tell that he was telling the truth because his voice was shaking and all my nieces were crying. My two brothers and I ran outside to see who was watching them. I noticed that my parents' dog, Buffy, a chow and golden retriever mix, was watching something. Her tail was down and all her hair was standing up. I ran to the woods where she was watching and called her to follow. She wouldn't come with me. I could hear something moving very fast away from me through the brush about a hundred yards from me. My two brothers and I split up and searched the area, but did not find anyone. I did find where it ran through the brush, but that's all. The following weekend, my oldest brother and two daughters were at my parents for a visit. I showed up about two in the afternoon and walked into the house. About five minutes, both of my nieces ran into the house screaming. They both stated that they saw a big man watching them from the edge of the woods. I grabbed a gun and had my oldest niece show me where he was standing. I asked my niece to describe what he was wearing. She said he was all black and very tall. I searched the area for about two hours and didn't find anything or see anyone. Then another time, August it was, I spent the night at my parents again. A loud vocalization woke me. Then it vocalized again. I've never heard anything like it before. I was able to record its vocalization. I played it to several people and was not able to identify what made it. Somewhere I have the recording. That fall, two of my friends were in the same section of woods hunting rabbits. David and Tex were separated by about a hundred yards. The hunt ended suddenly when David saw something that really scared him. Later that day, Tex called to tell me that David saw a Bigfoot, and he refuses to go in the woods again. I don't know what to make of it. I didn't know that there were any reports of any sightings in Maine, nor the Northeast. In fact, I'm very skeptical about its existence. The woods in this area are very thick and have a large amount of rabbits, turkeys, and deer. Coyotes and some moose are occasionally seen. D. Richardson In the 1980s, it was rare, very rare, to receive a report that mentioned strange screaming, howls, and such. I don't recall ever hearing someone say a Sasquatch growled. There was only the more famous Puyallup extended moaning-like howl that seems lost to any notice these days. Currently, however, screams, howling, and growling, of all things, seem to be trending like the Roadrunner reports. In fact, looking at the data, 
all manner of vocalizations are trending right up there as the most commonly reported occurrence. In the 1990s, the most reported Sasquatch feature was the conical head, the pointy head, the dunce cap look. Those reports suddenly stopped when Mississippi film analyst M.K. Davis produced a continuum of stabilized slow motion frames from the film attributed to Roger Patterson, which showed the supposed conical head moving to and fro with each step the creature took. As it turned out, what was previously thought to be a cone-shaped skull was a movable top knot of hair that moved back and forth with each step the subject in the film took as she advanced up the creek bed. There never was a conical head. Funny how that film influenced physical descriptions before Davis stabilized the film. Bigfoot steals deer kill from Hunter. A gunsmith named Ed Sizemore from Yadin County, North Carolina, sent in his memory of a childhood event that involved something that was capable of easily stepping over a five-strand barbed wire fence like it was nothing. During childhood summers, Sizemore and another friend he named Patrick spent time building and playing in a fort they built up in a loft of an old hay barn, where they could see in most directions the landscape, including a farm pond and rolling cow pastures that were fenced with five-strand barbed wire to keep cattle from straying into the woods. His letter picks up here. While in the barn loft playing one day, we looked across the pasture towards the pond. We saw a very hairy beast on all fours drinking water from our farm pond. This amazed us, as there were no cattle or horses in the pasture the whole time. At first we just thought it was somebody's cow in need of water. The summer was very hot. My friend went to get a pair of binoculars to see what it was. Before he could leave, the thing stood up on its hind legs and walked back towards the woods. En route, the hairy beast stepped over a five-strand barbed wire fence. It was a tall, dark brown, almost black creature. I would say about eight foot tall after it stood up. It stepped over a five-strand barbed wire fence like it was nothing. I didn't go looking for tracks. I was scared stiff after we heard the screeching sound that sounded almost like fingernails on a chalkboard. We never told anybody about this, not until recently when I heard about a hunter tracking in the same area. He claimed that he shot a deer, but before he could find it, he heard, in his words, the damnedest, scariest screeching he had ever heard in his entire life. When he got to the kill site, something had dragged his deer off, and he wasn't about to go look for it. I've told my wife about it and a friend by the name of Durand Hare. I don't know the deer hunter's name. I hang out in a gun shop when I'm not working. I'm also a gunsmith. He was relating the deer kill story to a man there, and I was listening in. When I started the rock throwing project, it was to search the database for only those reports that spoke to the issues regarding known Sasquatch behavior patterns, specifically the art of throwing things, rocks, pine cones, boulders, machinery, and other equipment. The data showed that the Sasquatch, for whatever reason, will throw just about anything available. There tends to be an alternative attention getter that various Bigfoot will use and that is the banging on houses, cabins and campers, or window peeping. Getting back to this rock throwing behavior, it can have many meanings. Rock throwing can be done in an effort to gain attention, ward off, defend or frighten someone away. It may also carry a message that the rock thrower intends to do in the trespasser and no matter if the unconscious trespasser knows he is trespassing. Boulder pushing and boulder heaving rock and dirt slides will no doubt convince the most strong-willed individual that he's not wanted in a given area. If that doesn't work, a robust scream that rattles your chest is often employed. There is no real way to know the intent behind the rock throwing behavior. We can only record the behavior and benefit from the statistics. There are cases in the database of the Sasquatch using rocks to down a bird or to nail a rabbit on the run. One other instance was filed where the informant saw a Sasquatch launch a rock sidearm that downed a small Texas deer. It was described similar to the throwing of a discus. Less lethal, of course, is the pine cone, but few are the pine cone throwing reports. It may be that the rock throwing areas are stocked with piles of stones where there are no stones naturally. Mounds of stones have been found in odd locations. Piles of pine needles, pine cones, and stones are curiously found. Minor aggression, 
Pinecone's Throne. Bigfoot enthusiast John Mayanzinski had a rather frightening encounter during an outing in the Wind River Mountains of Wyoming in 1972. He was at a base camp for a government-sponsored bighorn sheep study. All alone that night, he was awakened by what appeared to be a large hand pressing on the top of his six-foot-high tent. Thinking it was perhaps a bear, he quickly realized it had stubby fingers and a distinctive thumb, a primate hand, not a bear. During a radio interview, Mayansinski told his audience that he could hear breathing at a rate of six breaths a minute, and then the unthinkable happened. The Sasquatch proceeded to collapse the tent around him, and then it ran off into the dog hair pines and the protective darkness of the trees. Mayansinski kept watch during the night by his campfire, while the creature moved around intermittently throwing pine cones at him for long hours into the night. Mayansinski worked around the clock studying Sasquatch, spending summers accessing possible habitat and food sources, setting camera traps, and trying to snare DNA. He collected plaster casts of big footprints from across the west. The largest was 18 inches long and 8 inches across. A wildlife biologist specializing in big horned sheep and grizzly bear studies, Mayansinski once, while working for Wyoming Game and Fish, took hair and skin samples to an agency's lab for analysis. An irate superior threatened to have him fired if Mayansinski's name was ever publicly associated with this Bigfoot thing. What an interesting position for the fish and game officer to maintain. Nevertheless, Mayansinski worked quietly after that and kept any interest in the existence of Sasquatch to himself. The behavior Mayansinski reported is the only one of its kind that I've heard and it speaks to minor aggression or perhaps irritation with his presence. John Mayansinski Thanks for listening. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member by clicking the join button below this video. Member perks include two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways, members-only polls, photos and status updates, and more. We hope to see you as a member soon, and thanks for all your support.